Hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining at WMP grad seminar. Today we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Sarah Griffith. She is a PhD student from Brown University. And her topic today is the Torelli theorem for graphs. Uh, Sarah, you can go ahead. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna talk about this Torelli theorem. Um, so here in the title, um, I say the Torelli theorem again, and the again here refers to um, the fact that there's a, a history of results. And in particular, something I would like to state if we get to it today is um, an extension of um, one of these results uh, within a history. And all the results within that history are called like Torelli type theorems. Um, so the stuff here is motivated by classical algebraic geometry. Um, I don't expect to talk about that today, just uh, like graphs and combinatoric stuff. Um, okay, so my main goal is just to state, um, so first off, a previously proven Torelli theorem for graphs. Um, and second, um, what the extension of it that um, I proved uh, and hope to do something with is. So, first off, if you're talking about graphs, you know, there's always like some boilerplate up front. Um, so here's what we mean by a graph. Um, first off, um, it's always going to be finite. Um, there's never going to be any uh, loops allowed. So by a loop, I mean something like this. Um, in edge, that connects a vertex to itself it's always going to be two connected. So that means that there's no single vertex I can pick out where if I remove it, I cut the graph into two components. Um, it's also always going to be two edge connected. Um, so what this means is that if I take a particular, um, a particular edge and I cut it, um, it never separates the graph into two parts um, equivalently. Every um, every edge is in some cycle that doesn't visit the same vertex, except possibly at the beginning, except at the beginning and the end. Um, and also, um, we're not interested in cyclic graphs. So these conditions up here: the no loops, the two connected, the two edge connected, and not cyclic. Um, by which I mean that it's not something along the lines of a bunch of vertices just in a circle like that, these conditions um, have to do with the limits of the ability of the objects I'm going to discuss to see certain features of the graph. So um, they won't really know about things like this. Um, they'll get confused by things like this, and they won't know about things like this. And um, in this case, everything you can say is boring. So we're just ruling that out for that reason. Um, OK. So when we talk about graphs, um, we'll call them G or H. And if you see me write G or H, I always mean that to be a graph. Um, graphs always have some specified orientation. Um, that's really important to the data of the kind of objects we're going to define. Um, but the orientation itself um, doesn't actually matter. Um, so what I mean by an orientation is that each edge is going to have a specified target vertex and it's going to have a specified origin vertex. And finally, let me mention that the graphs we're talking about, we haven't ruled out multiple edges. So something like this, where there's two vertices and two edges between them, this is perfectly fine. Okay. So every graph has an associated graphic matroid. M of G. So I'm going to describe what a graphic matroid is and how you get one from a graph. So um, given a graph uh, G, M of G is a pair. So the first thing in the pair is we have the set of all the edges of G. And the second thing in the pair is the collection of subsets of the edges that form cycles. So here's an example of a graphic matroid. So here's some graph. I've suppressed the orientation information since we don't care about it at the moment. And this, uh, this graphic matroid here associated with it consists of the edge set and then the data of all these cycles that appear 
in the graph. And that's all. Um, so this bit on the right, the cycles, there's a certain like misleading element to this because the way I've presented them here preserves their spatial relationships. Actually, what M of G set sees is just, um, these are just sets of edges. So a priori, it doesn't know which ones are next to each other or which ones will um, follow from each other within a particular cycle. Um, it does know a little bit about uh, intersections. So it does know that this cycle and this cycle intersect. Um, something that's notably absent here is any mention of the vertices. Um, so this is kind of a lossy rendering of a graph. So here's, uh, here's what an isomorphism of graphic matrix is. Um, it's just a bijection on the edge sets that preserves the cycles. So another way of putting it would be that it induces also a bijection between the associated sets of cycles. So here's an example, um, just graphically depicted, of a graphic matroid with um, an isomorphism with another graphic matroid, um, so that the underlying graphs that all this data comes from, they aren't isomorphic at all. And the bijection between edge sets that I'm suggesting with this is you take this part right here and you kind of grab it and you twist it to end up with these edges right here. So this in particular goes to this and this goes to this and then the relative positions of these aren't changed. Okay, so um, that's a demonstration of the lossiness of taking the matroid of a graph. Okay, so now we've got some, some basic definitions and what we need to do is make some more basic definitions so that I can get to the actual Torelli statement. Um, so, the kind of um, the prereqs here are the theory of flows. So um, that comes from the theory of electrical circuits, um, integral flows within those um, cycle spaces, and then these things called Jacobians. And we want to talk about the relationship between these and graphic matrices. So if we have a graph, we can construct a vector space called the cycle space. So it's suggestively um, denoted by H1GR. Um, so you can think of it as first cohomology of the graph. Um, and it contains in particular um, a certain subgroup um, called the collection of integral flows, which is denoted by H1GZ. So it's like the integral co first cohomology of the graph. So here's how you construct these objects. So first, you have a vector space, um, the one cochains on G, so, and these are functions from the edges of G to R. So you can think of those as weightings of the edges. Um, so you've got a vector space of those, and this has a canonical basis that we take to be orthonormal, consisting of the indicator functions for particular edges. So if I have an edge, I denote, uh, E, I denote its indicator function by E star or E dual. And this is our this is our basis that we always think about. Um, so within this, there's a subspace of what are called flows. So these are the assignments of weights to edges so that um, for all vertices, um, the weight of incoming edges is equal to, uh, the total weight of incoming edges is equal to the total weight of outgoing edges. So you can think of this as um, assigning amounts of like fluid or something like that, that's flowing through edges um, and they have to pass through vertices and you expect each vertex to have as much fluid flowing out as is flowing in. Um, okay, so this vector space right up here, the one cochains, just from the fact that we have an orthonormal basis in mind, um, this has an integer lattice inside it. 
um, and that consists of you know all the all the uh, vectors that if you write them in the coordinates of our basis um, just have integers as their coordinates. So if we intersect this integer lattice with the space of flows, um, that's the thing that we call H1GZ, um, the integral flows. Um, as it happens, the integral flows are themselves a lattice inside of H1GR. And to be completely clear about what I mean by a lattice, um, I mean something that kind of acts like a the standard um, integer subgroup of Rn that you're used to. Um, so it's a finitely generated abelian group. And if you take all real combinations, um, it turns out that uh, it's full dimensional. Um, so it's a discrete subgroup that spans uh, your vector space is one way of putting it. Um, Okay, so here's an example of how these look like. Um, so this is like just small enough that you can like actually do some visualization here. So H1GR in the case of this particular G right here um, is the R span of the following integer combinations of um, weights on the edges. Um, so how do you know that these things actually are in H1GR? So for example, for E1, um, oh, sorry. So if I pick a particular vertex, say this one right here, so the adjacent edges here are E1, which is pointing toward it, E2, which is pointing away, and E5, which is pointing towards it. So in this first integral linear combination right here, um, the uh, edges among E1, E2, and E5 that are adjacent to this vertex are exactly E1 and E5. And this is incoming, and this is incoming, and there's zero weight on the outgoing edges in this combination. And so that means that the two incoming edges, their weights have to sum to zero, which indeed we have here. So one way you can think of the negative appearing here is this edge is pointing towards our vertex. And we think of the negative as saying, well, um, if there's like fluid flowing through this or something, then it's flowing against the direction that the edge is pointing in. Um, and something similar for this. Um, okay, so do people have questions about how that's defined and whether that makes sense. I guess you wouldn't really have questions about whether it makes sense. I'm just asking whether it makes sense. Also a great excuse to take a sip of water. Um, okay. Allison, yes, please feel free to interrupt with questions. I don't mind. So h one gz in here, um, turns out to be exactly the z-span that is all integral combinations of these things right here. Um, so that assertion in particular tells you, um, I mean, either of these assertions right here in particular tells you that the space of flows is two-dimensional. And if you look at this graph kind of intuitively, it has two holes in it. Um, now, the dimension of the space of flows turns out to be the number of edges minus the number of vertices um, plus one. So that uses our connectedness hypothesis on the graph. Um, the definition is slightly different um, if it's not connected. Um, and we call this the genus of G. So sometimes within graph theory, um, there's a different definition of genus that gets used, um, which is about the minimal genus surface that you can embed your graph on. As far as I know, there's no relationship with this one. Um, so this is like a different thing. Um, so if you look up graph genus and it doesn't look like that, it's, it's fine. Okay, um, right, and and this genus like really does capture um, kind of the the topological topological information of how many holes there are. Um, 
it turns out that if you take your graph and you just contract a bunch of edges until you end up with like a, what's called a bouquet of circles like this, the number of circles you get um, is exactly the genus. Um, so, I mean, you can contract every edge and then, and then you would apparently end up a genus zero. So when I say contract a bunch of edges, like there's a little bit of strategy to it. Actually, you contract all the edges of a spanning tree. Um, okay. So this lets us define an object associated with a graph, which is called the graph Jacobian. Okay, so what is a graph Jacobian? So you take your space of flows and you quotient out by the integral flows. Um, and the thing you get is a flat metric torus. Um, so by flat metric, I mean that's it's um, inheriting a notion of distance from the vector space you were in, which has one by virtue of a canonical isomorphism with Rn given by your orthonormal basis. Um, okay, so here's the Jacobian of the graph that we were looking at on the previous slide. Um, so within the two-dimensional space of flows, you have a fundamental domain for the lattice. So in other words, something, uh, sorry, in other words, a subset that um, has a representative of every equivalence class in the, clo in the quotient. Um, and it's this parallelogram right here. So, um, you know, because I didn't want to draw um, five-dimensional space, um, we're just looking at this parallelogram within like the, the plane of flows. Um, and to get the actual Jacobian itself, you take this edge right here and you quotient it with this one, and you quotient these two edges together as well. Um, and that's the group, that's the Jacobian. Okay, so here's what the prior Torelli theorem for graphs says. So it's about the relationship between the Jacobian of a graph and its matroid. And it turns out they are pretty closely connected. So first off, um, you let M of G be the matroid of G and Suppose you have an isomorphism between the matroid of G and the matroid of some graph H. So remember this means a bijection of the edges so that all the cycle data gets preserved. Um, so this um, turns out to induce an isomorphism from Jacobian of G to Jacobian of H um, using um, the arbitrary orientations that we fixed on our graphs implicitly. Um, so how does this work? Um, this is not the theorem. This is precursor slash motivation to the theorem, to be clear. Um, so first off, you look at the one cochains. Um, and if you want to know how to map a particular, um, a particular indicator function, um, you take it to the edge that phi says it should go to. So like that. Now it turns out that because this phi right here actually is an isomorphism of matroids, um, this actually restricts to also give an isomorphism between the spaces of flows. And it further turns out that that isomorphism between the spaces of flows actually passes in a well-defined way through the quotients down to the Jacobians. And so you get an isomorphism of the Jacobians as well. Um, so those of you who have, um, particular afflictions of the, of the brain may be thinking, ah, um, she's just described a functor. Um, you actually need, um, more data than I've just described to actually turn this into a functor. Um, this turns out to be like kind of a significant part of the, of the proof of the extension I ended up working with. Um, but like, Morally, you should think of this as something that's like at least very close to a functor from matroids of graphs to Jacobians. Um, okay, so here's the prior Torelli theorem. So this was proved by Kaparos and Viviani in 2010, and at the same time by Sue and Wagner. 
Um, so this right here um, was proven in the context of um, algebraic geometry motivated stuff. So tropical curves um, and kind of the kind of combinatorics that pops out of that. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, um, I would suggest this paper. On the other hand, this paper comes from like a really combinatorial point of view, and it proves it in um, somewhat greater generality for, uh, I believe, uh, representable matrix. Um, and also, um, I think the writing in this one is like particularly clean. Um, okay, so here's here's essentially the theorem. So if you have two edge connected graphs and you have an isomorphism between their Jacobians, and when I say an isomorphism between their Jacobians, I'm not just talking about an abstract group isomorphism, it also has to preserve the metric structure. Um, then it turns out this actually lifts to an isomorphism between the matroids of those graphs. Um, this may be a reasonable moment for actually me to just like inject a little bit of the algebraic geometry history here. So um, the, the really classical original Torelli theorem um, is actually about Riemann surfaces. And it turns out that each Riemann surface has something that you can call a Jacobian associated with it. Um, and isomorphisms of Jacobians um, along with some extremely important extra data, um, gives you an isomorphism of their associated Riemann surfaces. Um, so that's kind of, that's the history that this kind of thing is coming from. Um, okay, so this lifting right here to an isomorphism of matroids, um, it turns out it's not unique. And the reason that it's not unique is specifically because edges can be permuted within something called a series class, which as you can see from this arrow is described on the next slide. So here's what a series class is. A series class is a maximal collection of edges that all belong to the same cycles. So I've drawn here um, what I'm calling a typical series class. And you should think of this as what they look like in general, um, which is, so the red edges here, this one, this, this, and this, these together all form a series class. And the global structure of the graph kind of looks like a bunch of little subgraphs lying along this big circle. And the bridges between the little subgraphs are the edges in the series class. So from this point of view, I don't think it's too hard to justify that um, if an edge is going to belong to a cycle that um, doesn't visit the same vertex twice, um, and one of these red edges is included, then all the other red edges are included because you kind of have to travel along these subgraphs sequentially, which means you have to cross these bridges that um, I'm claiming constitute the series class. Okay. Um, another definition is that if you have a maximal subset of edges so that cutting any two separates the graph, then that's a series class. Um, so the red ones here are the only ones that belong to a series class with um, more than one member, which, okay, I guess actually if you take this as the definition, then you have to say, um, edges uh, where if you cut two distinct ones or you have just one edge, then it, um, if you cut two distinct ones, it separates the graph or if you have just one edge. Um, so actually let's stick with this, let's stick with this definition here. Um, but uh, yeah, so these edges right here, these are going to be responsible for any ambiguity and lifting an isomorphism of uh, the Jacobian for this graph um, to the Jacobian of another graph to an isomorphism of matrix. Okay. Um, 
Now uh, we want to talk about something called the Abel Jacobi maps. So these are maps that let you take the structure of your graph and see it kind of sent into the Jacobian. Um, so here's how this works. So first off, to define an Abel Jacobi map, you need to fix a base vertex V. Um, you can think of this as a vertex that we're going to travel from. And we define a function from the vertices of G to the Jacobian. And here's how this works. I give you any vertex W that I want to be the input. And within the graph, I take any path from V to W. Um, I should have indicated this is from V. Okay, now along that path, um, you track the sequence of edges that you cross. And you take a sum of the indicator functions for the edges you cross. Now, if you cross with the direction of an edge, then when you add the indicator function for that edge to your sum, you take coefficient positive one. If you cross against the direction of that edge, you take negative one. Um, so in this case, going here, I go with the edge, I get coefficient one in my sum. I go against the edge, I get coefficient negative one, and I go with the edge and I get another positive coefficient. Okay, now this sum right here lives in the space of one cochains. We take its orthogonal projection to the space of flows. So this is uh, taking the flow that is closest in um, the metric on the vector space to um, our path. And then we pass that along to the Jacobian, quotienting out by the um, integral flows. Okay, so once we've got the definition of the first Abel Jacobi map, we can define higher ones. And the way that works is um, we take the nth symmetric product of the, vert of the vertices. So that means just collections of n vertices, not all necessarily distinct. Um, and then I apply the first Abel Jacobi map to them individually. So if I'm looking at the nth of Jacobi map, the input is going to be n vertices, and I take paths for all of those individually. And I follow this procedure up here to get something down in the Jacobian. I should point out, by the way, um, that the fact that this is well defined is something you have to check um, because you had a choice of path up here. Um, but it turns out that. The quotient that defines the Jacobian tells you that this is this is actually okay. So when you're at this step, the thing you have actually isn't well defined yet. It's only after you pass the Jacobian that everything works out. Um, okay, so if you take the g minus oneth Abel Jacobi map, that's called the theta divisor associated with your base vertex. So what does it mean to be a theta divisor? Um, so this is another thing that comes from um, classical algebraic geometry. Um, and uh, in there, a theta divisor is like a hypersurface within Jacobian. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite line up well with this situation, but that's what it's called. Um, okay, and so here's, here's the theorem I proved. Um, so, you can think of it as a lifting problem. Um, you can think of the, the question it's trying to solve as a lifting problem from matroids, um, which is if I have an isomorphism between matroids, can I lift that to an isomorphism of graphs? So are the graphs actually isomorphic? Um, so remember, this is not something you expect to be true in general because taking matroids is so lossy. Um, so here's the answer. Um, subject to our earlier hypotheses on graphs. So first off, the isomorphism of matroids tells you that you have an isomorphism of Jacobians. And then you check whether there's an edge G so that um, this isomorphism of Jacobians takes the um, theta divisor associated with the target of that edge 
to the theta divisor associated with the target of the corresponding edge in the other graph. So if the answer is no, there is no such edge, it never lifts. If the answer is yes, then you may have to do some permutation within a series class, um, which is in general like a, a series class with more than one element is like a source of ambiguity with the kind of objects we're talking about. Um, but after you've done that, you get an isomorphism of the graphs. And so in particular, an isomorphism of the graph it graphs exists. Um, and so this theorem actually tells you, uh, it actually gives you an algorithm for producing the isomorphism of the relevant graphs. Um, okay, so I think I'm up at, I think I'm up at time. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, but... great. Then I think that's a great place to call it. Uh, like, okay. Thank uh, did you. You want to continue or? Can... Oh, uh -huh. sorry. I sorry. I thought the talk was a half hour. I have more material. I just. Oh, uh... no, that, that's fine. That's fine. I'm just not sure okay. if my other speaker is here or not. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the talk. Let mm -hmm. me stop the recording.